Wisconsin's longest serving state lawmaker, Senator Brad Risser. The contenders are former Alder Brian Ben Ford, a current success coach for the UW-Madison Odyssey program. William Davis III, a former member of the military and a 2018 writing candidate for Lieutenant Governor. Nada el Makashvi, who most recently worked at the Capitol after graduating from UW-Madison. Wisconsin Environmental Initiative Head, John Imes, a member of the Shorewood Hills Village Board and former state assembly candidate. Small retail business owner, Amani Latimer Burris, recent UW-Madison graduate and former Democratic field organizer, Aisha Mo, and former state lawmaker and gubernatorial and congressional candidate, Kelda Royce, who owns a real estate company. Thank you all for being here. Democratic voters will choose between these seven candidates on or before August 11th. Because no Republican or third party candidate is in the race, the winner won't face a challenger during the November election and will all but certainly be seated come January. Some voters within the 26th Senate District will also have the opportunity to elect a new state lawmaker in the 76th Assembly District. The Cap Times hosted a Democratic primary debate for that seat on July 22nd, so you can go back and watch it on our website or Facebook page. For this event, our seven candidates will get two minutes each for their opening and closing statements, and in between, I will be asking them questions, some posed to all candidates and some individually. For most questions, candidates will have two minutes to answer. Each candidate will also have four opportunities to make one minute responses to a question directed at an opponent. Given that there are seven of you, we will be strict about keeping candidates to time so that we can get to all of the topics people wanna to hear about. If you go over in your response to a question, I will cut you off to move on to the next speaker. Now we'll begin with opening statements. Prior to the start of the debate, Chris did a drawing to determine the order. We'll, we will begin with Ms. el -Makashvi. You have two minutes to provide opening remarks. Thank you, Brianna. Hi, everyone. Thank you to Cap Times for hosting this debate and to everyone who has come tonight uh, to engage in our democracy. My name is Nadal Makashvi and I immigrated from Sudan to Madison when I was six years old. Growing up, I experienced how the lack of affordable housing, racial and economic inequity, and a crumbling healthcare system burdened my family and my neighbors here in Madison. I sit before you tonight as an unapologetic member of the working class who is fighting for progress in Madison, not for millionaires, corporations, or lobbyists. I have laid out a truly progressive platform. We've spoken out on the topic of Black Lives Matter and police brutality. We are bringing the boldest climate justice platform in Wisconsin history to the Capitol. We are committed to fair and clean elections, which means limiting wealthy donors and influence peddling, ending partisan gerrymandering and ensuring the right to vote. The political status quo in Wisconsin is broken. We're still living in the shadow of Scott Walker with his henchmen, Robin Voss and Scott Fitzgerald, who do whatever it takes to cling to power. Having political experience alone has failed to meet this moment in history. Democrats in office must be responsive to our new reality and to fight even harder. But our politics have literally evolved into a life or death situation with over 150,000 Americans dead from COVID-19, many of, some of whom were which uh, of my family. As a Democrat, I will stand up and fight like hell for what's right. Our campaign is a diverse coalition that includes the Planned Parenthood Advocates of Wisconsin, Voces de la Frontera, Democratic Socialists of America, and all three education labor groups that have endorsed in this race, MTI, AFT Wisconsin, and TAA. More importantly, we have over a thousand individual working class contributions and have hundreds of volunteers building grassroots power. Together, we're gonna give the progressive movement a home in the Wisconsin State Capitol. Capital. I look forward to engaging with the debate tonight and I hope all of you will join our movement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Ben Ford, you're next. Thank you, Brianna. And thank you, Capital Times, for hosting this and everybody for tuning in. I hope you're all well. For the last 30 years, I worked in Madison's most vulnerable communities as a family advocate, educator, and activist, where I've served thousands of people in need. I've learned how to serve others in intense emotional situations and how to listen and take action on people's struggles. If we take a step away from politics and look at the human side, we can see that there are so many families in our city that have been hurt by the pandemic and its economic ramifications. I am the most prepared out of anybody in this race because I work with these families each and every day. There's moms and dads who don't know where their next paycheck is coming from. 
They don't know how they're going to put food on the table, and they're crying out for help. Unfortunately, politicians have failed us again and again because they don't have the compassion or experiences needed to lead, especially during these times. You know, I'm not some career politician. During this campaign, I'm still working long days, and I'm fighting for those in need, families that need access to health care, students that need access to quality education, small businesses that are on the brink of bankruptcy and need our help. So I'm fighting for my kids in our communities, which have been ignored for far too long by those in power. We are running a grassroots campaign and we don't have the tens of thousands of dollars that some of my opponents are working with, but we have something that they don't. And that's, we we'll always had the principle of people over money. And that's been our motto from day one. So if you're looking for a candidate that can't be bought, if you're looking for a candidate that cares for you and your families, I'm your candidate. Just for the last 30 years that I fought for families all across Madison, I'll continue that fight as your next state senator. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mo, you're next. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Aisha Mo, and I'm running for state senate in the 26th Senate District to protect the environment, reduce the student debt crisis, legalize cannabis, rework the entire criminal justice and policing system, and lastly, to create a Badger Care for All system, healthcare coverage for every Wisconsinite. I first got started in politics at age 17. At that time, Donald Trump was this crazy dude who was running for president. <laughs> um, um, but one evening in early May of 2016, my youngest brother, who was nine years old at the time, came home crying from school because someone had told him that if Donald Trump became elected, we would get deported because we were Muslim. Mm. And it was in that moment that I realized that even, an, even a candidate for elected office has the power to change the way that we view ourselves and how we view others in our community. I got to work. I got started in community organizing for the Democratic Party, both in the 2016 election and in the 2018 election, where we saw Tammy Baldwin win back her seat and uh, Tony Evers got elected. I'm running for state senate now in 2020 to push a progressive conversation into the legislature. As a young person and a young candidate, I stand for the values that are far left without fear and with only the vision for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Royce. Please go ahead and take two minutes for your opening remarks. Thank you so much, Brianna. Thanks for the Capital Times for hosting and to all of you for watching. We are at an incredible tipping point moment in our state and in our country. We face huge, serious challenges. Uh, first and foremost, a global deadly pandemic that Wisconsin unfortunately is on the wrong end of. And uh, the economic crisis that's resulting from that, that is jeopardizing what little economic security um, many Americans already had. We also face a political crisis, which has failed to address either of these challenges and the underlying disparities that both the economic crisis and COVID are making far worse, like racial, racial disparities and economic disparities. I've spent my life working to create opportunities for other people. I know that I was very lucky to be raised in Madison and to have um, the privileges that I had. And it's always been my firm conviction that every single child deserves the kind of opportunities that my sisters and I had growing up here and more. That's the core of my political philosophy. And it's what drove me after law school to not take a big corporate job, but instead go fight on the front lines for reproductive rights as the head of NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin. There, I worked not only to defend the right to choose, but also to prioritize the terrible racial disparities in infant mortality that were plaguing our state. Then I ran for the state assembly, and I served two terms. And in our first term, we were in the majority, and I was frustrated that we didn't get as much done as we had wanted, but still we were able to make progress even with a narrow, razor-thin uh, majority. We were able to expand Badger Care to over 30,000 people. And then we went into the minority and unfortunately we were fighting on the front lines against Scott Walker's attack on unions. Now for the last six, seven years, I've been out of politics. For the most part, I've been running my small business and raising my family. But my convictions and my progressive values remain true. 
I'm the candidate that has the experience of turning those progressive values and passions into real state policy, and that's what we need right now. Thank you so much. Mr. Davis, we're going to you next. You have two minutes. Hi, my name is William Henry Davis III. Um, I am running for Senate District 26. I ran for Lieutenant Governor 2018. Um, one of the things that I want to say is I've always been in involved with politics since I was in seventh grade. I've always loved politics with my heart. And um, one of the things that I realized that oftentimes get ignored within both parties is politicians that get elected and they do not acknowledge our poor, our low income and our low wage citizens. Also our homeless, our disabled, that's what William Henry Davis III is going to fight for and propose in legislation. I'm going to fight for animal rights, uh, small businesses. Um, I'm going to also help pass and propose legislation that will legalize marijuana, uh, expand Medicaid, Badger Care Plus, help with housing so that we can give housing to our hundreds of thousands of citizens without homes or apartments. I want to help fight for our safety of our children, our schools and education. That's the top priority. We need to make sure that our children that come from impoverished communities are represented and that they have a politician that is going to give benefits for them and their families. I want to fight for the minimum wage. I am against corporations, big corporations. Uh, I want minimum wage to be increased for the state of Wisconsin, $15 for small business owners. And I want them to pay fair wages to the citizens. For corporations, I want $20 an hour for our citizens to receive for employment. Wisconsin cannot afford a politician that's gonna get in office and choke up against the Republican party. We need a Democrat that's going to fight for our citizens, and that is William Thank Henry Davis III. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Appreciate your remarks. Uh, Mr. Imes, we've been having some technical issues with you. Let's check in with you first. Can we hear you? Nope, still can't hear you. You said you had a, a phone in. Um, are you able to use that line? How about now? I can hear you now. Oh, there we go. All right, go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, I mean, it worked, worked great six hours ago, so... Well, first, let me thank the Cap Times, uh, Chris and Brianna, for holding this candidate forum, of course, for your good work on developing the people's agenda. You know, as I walked around the neighborhood near Madison Kip Corporation on the east side last week, it reminded me a lot of my working class roots. My dad was a window cleaner who did not finish high school, and her upper flat was 100 yards from the factory with loud aircraft uh, overhead landing at the airport. Today, I'm an elected official, environmental nonprofit leader, small business owner, and married dad of four children rooted in the 26th Senate District for 26 years. I bring a uniquely diverse experience to governing and work with stakeholders on issues that allow me to engage more effectively and build the coalitions we need to win back a Democratic majority. As your state senator, I'll work to implement the bold, high road progressive policies and will stand up for local businesses, workers, and families by putting people first. I believe we can come out of this crisis healthier, stronger, and more resilient as a community but only if we implement an economic recovery plan that works for all and prioritizes workers and public health, affordable health care, paid sick family and medical leave, and direct economic relief. I'll also work to implement a broad Wisconsin-based Green New Deal that includes innovative policies to be a leader in clean energy, climate action, and sustainable communities, a plan that provides well-paying jobs and helps restore Wisconsin's leadership tradition. That environmental leadership background is sorely missed, and a main reason why I was endorsed by Therese Berceau, who represented the district and the legislature for 20 years. Why I earned the support of Tia Nelson, the daughter of former governor, U.S. Senator and Earth Day founder, Gaylord Nelson, who said I was the only candidate with the credentials to build back our economy and take climate action. Voters today want dedicated, experienced, and effective leadership to transcend the extreme divisiveness and an action of today's state politics. And I look forward to sharing more details on some of my ideas here tonight. For more, please visit johnimes.com. Thanks again. Thank you. So glad we got your micro working. Um, Ms. Latimer Burris, you're finishing, our, finishing us off. Go ahead. Okay, so I am Amani, Amani Latimer Burris, and I am running for you. 
I am running for this race in Wisconsin State Senate for you, for me, and for us. Because I have found that we need freedom. I need freedom, you need freedom, and we all need the freedom to breathe again. This election is not about me. It's about reaching out, it's about connecting, and it's about building community coalitions. This election is not about fight, fight, fight. It's about advocating for your rights and for my rights. Mayor Soglin saw that in me when he endorsed me. As a community organizer in the field of Waukesha and Milwaukee, I got that our voting rights are at stake and I will work to fix that. As a former teacher and a lifelong educator, educator, excuse me, I know that the answers, the solutions, come from listening and acknowledgement and understanding and empathy. And I understand that we need progressive policies that have real impact on the people that are living everyday lives in this COVID-19 dilemma and that are worried about putting food on the table, having a place to live and a place to be and having their kids go to school and be educated and all the other things that we have as responsibility as parents. And as a mama with two teenagers, I understand that their environment is at stake. I understand that their environment is at stake. I understand that their environment is at stake and we have to do something for the future. So as a wife who is married to a public defender and a sister, as a sister to a brother who has been in and out of the system for 40 years and, and at times unnecessarily, I get that the criminal justice system needs reform. Sorry to cut you off, but that's been two minutes. Um, we'll be sure to get back to the, some of those thoughts in, in our later questions. Um, thank you all for, Thank you all for that. Um, like I mentioned, we're gonna move on to some individual questions. And at this point, candidates will have two minutes to answer. And after that, any contender can jump in with a response of up to one minute. Many of these questions are inspired by the responses we've gotten so far to our people's agenda. That effort aims to help guide the stories we cover during this election cycle and beyond based on reader and community input. Um, we'll start with some issues surrounding the COVID-19 crisis. And Mr. Benford, this first question is for you. You've talked about the importance of prioritizing scientific recommendations to combat COVID-19 while safeguarding individuals through the remainder of the pandemic. One of the things you've pledged to do if elected is push the state to send out monthly cash payments to individuals. How do you envision that working? How much money are, money are we talking per individual or household? And how does the state pay for that when we're facing a budget short? That's a really wonderful question, Brianna, and I really appreciate it. The best way that I can answer that is that when you look at two insidious diseases ravaging our world, COVID-19 and for much longer systemic racism, in my opening statement, I talked about families that are really struggling, really suffering, that they've lost their jobs, that small businesses have been devastated. That what I tell people in my uh, capacity as a family advocate over the last 30 years is that I see a meteor headed for the city of Madison, for the state of Wisconsin, for our nation, when people are placed out of their housing, when they don't have access to health care, when they're struggling to find food, diapers, and medicine, that this city we all love so much that wins national accolades could run the risk of becoming a tent city for the most marginalized and vulnerable people. So I feel like we have no other alternative. Now, how would I get the money? All of the questions that you're gonna to ask tonight, I'm not living in a bubble, I'm not naive. I know there's a majority party that's demonstrated a total disregard for our lives, for our democracy, and that uh, we are gonna run against obstacles that are common sense. They've already ignored the best science that's out there. But as your next state senator, I would advocate to heighten the level of awareness of why this is important, and I would do everything in my power to bridge co coalitions to come together to find the economic support that people will need. Thank you so much. At this point then, any candidate can use one of their four opportunities to give a one minute response to this topic. Um, at this point, I would just ask anyone who's interested to raise hands. 
And seeing none, I will move on to the next question, which is for Ms. Royce and also about COVID-19. Um, you and the other candidates have noted that the state will be dealing with the fallout from COVID-19 for the foreseeable future. How would you evaluate lawmakers and their administration's response to the crisis thus far? And do you believe Governor Tony Evers should be more aggressive in putting in place a statewide mask mandate, for example, even though it would likely draw a legal challenge? Hmm. Well, I think this is a really important question because it gets to the heart of what is broken with our government and why I'm running. Tony Evers has taken every step that he can to be guided by science and to try to stay, save lives. And at every turn, whether it's trying to help shore up our unemployment with the federal funds that we could have gotten, whether it's with the, the mask mandate or whether it's with the safer at home order, the Republicans have conspired to block it. They worked with the Supreme Court that is, uh, completely bought and paid for by right-wing interests to force the state to reopen. And now Wisconsin is among the worst states in terms of COVID cases going through the roof. So, um, you know, I appreciate what Governor Evers has done and the position that he's in, but frankly, Robin Voss has made it very difficult. That said, I still think it's absolutely worth doing. This is a life or death situation. It's infuriating that we have bars open and airlines getting bailouts, but yet, schools are not going to be open and uh, families are going to be evicted from their homes and uh, you know working parents are having to quit or dial back their work to take care of kids um, all of this is preventable and even with the federal government that's completely dysfunctional and has failed to do this there is a lot of room for what wisconsin can do the first and most important thing that we could do is take the medicaid expansion not only would that create ten thousand new health care jobs but it would help cover tens of thousands of Wisconsinites at a time when it's critically important. I can't really see how we're gonna be able to balance the next state budget without accepting that Medicaid expansion. We can institute paid family and sick leave. This is essential for not just the frontline essential workers that are doing healthcare and service jobs. And I'm really proud to have the endorsement of SEIU and the Healthcare Heroes, as well as 20, nearly two dozen other labor unions. But, uh, Implementing those things alone would help us get the virus under control. We also, of course, have to deal with the economic fallout for small businesses. And that's where I think um, we could use a real targeted effort with working with the Republicans on that. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, does any candidate want to jump in on this topic? Seeing no hands, we will move on to the next question, which is for Ms. Latimer Burris. Um, when speaking to me in the past, you've highlighted four key areas, healthcare, education, housing, and social justice, all of which you've said are affected by what you're calling economic dignity. Why is it useful to look at issues through that interconnected lens? And how do you think that viewpoint could aid lawmakers in crafting policy solutions at the state level? Okay, thank you so much. And I realized last time, I just wanna announce that, that I was looking for like the timer, but I don't think I had the view right to see the timer. So yeah, um, it, you know, it's all interconnected. And I got that in 2008. Um, I used to own $4.2 million in property and I lost it all uh, uh, and ended up living in Super 8. And um, so as I crashed down through the middle class and, and into um, the working class and then um, beyond that, I got that at the base of everything is economics. And so if you don't have economic freedom, uh, economic security, economic dignity, which all goes uh, you know, together, then you cannot it, do a lot of these things. So when I started to chart my way out of that and how to keep my kids on, on a roll while we're homeless, I, it always came back to economics and connecting. And then as a black woman, as a mom, as a woman, it gets layered. So I think that we can create policies to protect homeowners and for to protect renters and to have a say in the matter because what happens is we have all the responsibilities but we do not have any of the protections. Thank you so much. Um, would anyone like to jump in on that topic? Seeing no hands, I will move on to the next question, which is for Mr. Davis. Um, Mr. Davis, in past interviews and um, also at the top of, of, of this event, you've stressed the importance of addressing economic hardships that individuals are facing, stemming from rent increases and low salaries. You said in your opening remarks that the state should implement a $15 minimum wage. Would you want that increased immediately or in a staggered way? And what other policies should lawmakers be looking at to, to address these issues? 
thank you for uh, picking me uh, for this. We need to increase it right away. Minimum wage is, I mean, look at the unemployment. Um, it's, it's horrible right now in Wisconsin. The citizens are doing really bad. They're struggling uh, bad. You should see the, the, the urban communities, which I call the hoods in my slang. It's hoods out, a lot of hoods, and it's a lot of people doing really bad. They need as much assistance as they can get. Uh, they need uh, legislation that will be aggressively addressed to the legislature so we can uh, target these issues right away. And uh, yes, there's going to be some resistance from the Republican Party, but we have to be strong and we have to fight. And that's what I'm going to do if I'm elected as a state senator. One of the things that we can do right now is uh, make sure that we try to propose uh, food economic assistance for our citizens right now, increase some of the benefits for those that don't have uh, access to uh, food, food share, EBT. Uh, that's a lot of citizens that are doing really bad. I, I can't say it enough. One of the things that we can do is just keep proposing legislation. And the more we do that, the more we can make things happen. And that's what William Henry Davis III is gonna do. Thank you so much. I believe I saw Mr. Ben Ford's hand. Yes, would you like to take one minute to respond or address that topic? Absolutely, and I really appreciate what Mr. Davis had said. When I was on the city council here in Madison, we raised the minimum wage here locally only to have it steamrolled by uh, the state. And uh, we recognize that here in Madison that even $15 an hour isn't enough to, uh, for most housing here. So that's desperately needed, and I really appreciate Mr. Uh, Davis's comments. Uh, we really do need to uh, take a look at that and create sustainable jobs that pay more than a living wage, especially here in the island of, uh, of Madison. Thank you. Thank you. I believe I saw Ms. Roy's hand next, so we'll go with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Brian is absolutely right. Not only do we need to raise the minimum wage, we need to allow local municipalities to make their own determinations about what constitutes a living wage in their community. But part of the big structural problems with our economy is that um, often workers who are earning the lowest wages also have the least security. They don't have benefits. And that's one reason that one of the big challenges we're going to face is how to make sure that every worker has health care. I've long supported a Badger Care for All system that would cover everyone with affordable quality health insurance. We also need to allow people to buy into a safe public pension system, whether you're an entrepreneur, a small business owner, or a worker. You can just take that public pension with you from job to job. And we need to guarantee paid family and medical leave for every single worker, regardless of where um, they're employed. Not only will this help people at the low in income earner um, level, but it will also help entrepreneurs and small business owners compete for and retain great employees. So it's a win-win for our economy. Thank you so much. Uh, would anyone else like to speak to this topic? Ms. Latimer Burris, please go ahead. Yeah, so again, um, after spending 15,000 hours in the Wisconsin State Statute uh, uh, defending, uh, you know, homeowners and renters and whatnot, uh, I think people have to really click in um, that we are on a very basic level. What I found is it took us about a year and a half to 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 fall out, um, and other people, it, it's going to go much quicker. And so we have to um, not only create laws, but we have to also educate people about what is available. One of the things that I was struggling with at the time was uh, health insurance, and I thought I couldn't afford Obamacare. So it's something that we uh, need to explain to people that you're not going to put out the $1,700 a month, you get insured, and how the whole system works. I think that's the issue with the political system in itself and these policies is they're in place but nobody explains it to everyday people of how they can make a difference and i think i can be the person to do that thank you um seeing no other hands at this point we're going to go back to mr davis who has 30 seconds if he wants to add anything else to this topic or address the issue further uh once again there's no one that understands poverty and the urban issues other than William Henry Davis III out of all seven candidates. Um, this is something that's undebatable, non-debatable. Uh, we, we need to elect a senator that's gonna care and actually 
do something and propose and create and have ideals, strategic ideals that will help give benefits for our citizens. Uh, I have a lot of proposed legislation if I get elected and we're just gonna keep the ball rolling once I get in, if I get in, that's it. Thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll move on to the next question now, which is also a different topic, and it is for Ms. Mo. Um, one thing we've heard about a lot from respondents to our people's agenda is bolstering fair elections and ensuring voters have access to the polls, an issue that's you know particularly relevant right now, two weeks before an election. Many Democratic lawmakers have recently been pushing to make Wisconsin an entirely by-mail voting state with limited in-person options on election day. Do you support that plan? And what else should the state be doing to make voting more accessible? Thank you so much for asking this question. Yes, right now during a national or a global pandemic, um, we have seen the breakdowns in our current um, system for voting. I 100% agree with a completely by mail um, uh, ball, um, sending ballots out completely by mail. Um, I also think that two other um, two other policies that would ex would help um, is allowing in person voting for two weeks before an election. There's no reason that I mean, there's no reason that when we're not in the middle of a global pandemic, you can't have in person voting two weeks ahead of time because of an all day voting on Tuesday when people are working is completely insane. We should definitely have in-person voting two weeks before an election. Um, secondly, I think that we should have automatic voter registration. We don't need to be scrubbing people off of our voter polls. What we need to be doing is making sure that everyone wants to become an eligible voter, whether that means turning 18 or moving into the state, is automatically registered. That's, I think, what would help. Thank you so much for asking. Thank you. Does anyone else want to address the um, topic of election security, voter, voting protections? Um, Ms. Latimer Burris, I see your hand. Please go ahead. My goodness, I feel like I'm on a talk show or a, on a game show. Ms. Latimer, I see your hand. Um, I Listen, I worked at the uh, Wisconsin Democratic Party uh, in this last election, and I worked overtime uh, just to try to uh, send up to our legal department all the, the uh, 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 obstacles to people voting. And so I think what we need to do is uh, we do need to send out the absentee ballots. We do need to have automatic voter registration. And in the city of Madison, as you know, uh, under normal circumstances, we can vote at the library and that's open and it's easy and we can get there. And again, we need to reach out to different communities united in our differences um, to get people out to the polls and to let them know what what is at stake? I was with the Black Women's Wellness a group today, and I was saying, it doesn't matter what's happening. You have to get out and vote. Otherwise, this election is not going to go the way that you want. And I'm talking about the November election. If they knew how close we were to electing Trump, people would get out and vote. We have to give people access. Thank you so much. Um, seeing no other hands on this topic, Ms. Mo, we're going to go back to you for 30 seconds if you want to expand more on this topic. Um, I also just think that it is really important that we have um, access right now to providing voter IDs to individuals because right now as the law is written we have to have voter IDs. So I'm in favor of driver's licenses for every citizen of Wisconsin. Thank you so much. I just want to put in a quick plug that curbside absentee, uh, curbside in-person absentee voting is currently available in Madison. So please take advantage of that if you haven't requested a by mail um, voting ballot. Next, we're going to turn to Mr. Imes and we're going to talk to you about environmental protections. You've talked about the importance of adopting a Wisconsin Green New Deal, something a few other candidates have voiced support for as well. You've acknowledged that could be more of a, a long-term goal though. What are the key tenets of a Wisconsin Green New Deal plan in your, in your viewpoint? And what are some shorter term steps the state could consider taking in the interim to combat climate change and pr promote renewable energy? Well, thanks, Brianna. I appreciate that. You know, the, the tenets of the Green New Deal really are a call to action. And when you think about 100% um, clean energy, you know, the Center on Wisconsin Strategy is already out with the report last year that talked about how Wisconsin would create 162,000 uh, clean energy jobs as a result of going 100% clean energy. 
uh, and some of those are manufacturing jobs. Uh, there's opportunities to up, update our grid. Uh, the, uh, the research and development capabilities at the UW can be tapped uh, for some of that. Uh, we need to rethink transportation. And that's uh, uh, not only electric uh, charging stations, but, um, but our fleets, uh, particularly school buses going 100%. You know, we're exposing uh, our kids to diesel emissions associated with uh, you know, diesel buses. So that should be a priority to reduce health impacts from air pollutants as we work towards a goal of, of zero emissions. Um, sustainable economic development is really key. Uh, green building and green retrofits are really key. You know, I was involved with the Garber Feed Mill. I was on the team that proposed that on the east side. It's located behind Obert Gardens. You know, that was $2 million for the city to landfill that building and clean up the soils. And instead, uh, we went in there and spent about $20 million and really made it uh, a showcase. And I think the state can leverage its permitting process, its building codes to accelerate high performance building. Uh, I talked about uh, sustainable uh, uh, economic incentives. You could have tax credits, you could have loan guarantees, you could have preference on purchasing contracts to local firms that achieve uh, superior environmental results and institute high road practices that protect workers. And then regenerative agriculture. You know, Wisconsin could really lead the world in regenerative agriculture practices to increase farmers' profit, uh, profits, rebuild our soils, clean our waterways, and expand renewable energy. And I think we could also empower more food entrepreneurship, you know, particularly for women, immigrants, and people of color to help reduce social economic. Thank you so much, Mr. I'm sorry to cut you off, but that's time. Um, Ms. Amlakashvi, I see your hand. Would you like to take a minute to add on to that? Yeah, thank you for that, um, Brianna and John Ives. I think addressing the climate crisis will take the largest investment and mobilization from our government that Wisconsin has ever seen. Um, on on day one in office, I'm prepared to echo activists in demanding a de uh, in demanding a declaration of a climate emergency in Wisconsin. I think that's step number one uh, in making sure that Wisconsin goes carbon free by 2030 because we cannot afford otherwise. Um, I think most importantly, the climate crisis is an environmental racism crisis. In Madison, we're seeing environmental injustice in real time with the F-35s. Uh, we mm -hmm. must push back against F-35s and demand climate justice by making targeted investments into marginalized communities across Wisconsin. Uh, you know, I was dismayed uh, when I first learned about the decision to ignore overwhelming community opposition and to place F-35 jets at Truox Field earlier this year. And I think it's a blatant example of the militarization of our communities. And along with the Green New Deal, we need to really advocate and be vocal about rejecting the F-35s in Madison. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, seeing no other hands on the topic of environmental protection slash Green New Deal, we're gonna go back to you, Mr. Imes. Feel free to take 30 seconds to wrap up this topic for us. Yeah, Brianna, I'll just say, uh, you know, if the F-35s come, what I've said is we should have a clean energy jobs district there and use green infrastructure and uh, use deep energy uh, retrofits, provide jobs, provide, um, uh, for ju justice compromised individuals, transitionary jobs, uh, apprenticeships, there's, a, there's an opportunity there for us to do green infrastructure and do some other things, which I think are going to be important uh, for addressing uh, th those impacts from aircraft operations. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, Ms. Almakashvi, we're going back to you now for the final question of this section. Over the course of your campaign, you haven't been shy about criticizing the democratic establishment and infrastructure in Wisconsin. And that's just you know, not something we typically hear from candidates about their own party, particularly first-time candidates. Do you think legislative Democrats and the party are doing enough currently to fight for all Wisconsinites? And if not, what more should they be doing? Um, for me, I declared against Senator Risser in January because uh, I went around my communities and I asked them when was the last time a Democratic lawmaker came and asked you what you needed, uh, what problems needed to be fixed, and they couldn't remember. In my 19 years here, I couldn't remember. Uh, there was a large gap in leadership that I saw affected the people of color uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, I support the party, but I understand that in order to be the best we can, we need to do better. Um, I think the Wisconsin Republican Party is the biggest issue facing our community and so many communities across Wisconsin and Democrats need to be stronger in our opposition for them. Uh, progress is quashed at every turn by Robin Voss and Scott Fitzgerald. 
uh, whose gerrymandered legislature has allowed them to gut and loot our state government and services, uh, which are meant to serve the people. We cannot be on the defensive. We have to be on the offensive. Uh, you know, we're finding over and over again that the crazed right wing hate machine uh, will do anything to stomach progress and they refuse to share power even when they lose uh, elections. This is a threat to our democracy. It's a threat to our economy. It's a threat to the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, it's harmed our children and our teachers and it's displaced low wage workers and resulted in far too many evictions and, and an affordable housing crisis. Um, it's led to Wisconsinites quite literally dying because they take because they, they refuse to take federal money for expanded expanding healthcare, and I think that there is a tendency to negotiate and hide hide a lack of initiative within the Democratic Party behind Republican obstructionism. Um, I think that times are changing and that means the Democrats must also change. Uh, we haven't done enough to really combat these big structural issues when we are in power. Wisconsin has just become the most segregated state in the country. Um, I think we need a politician who uh, will and a a legislator in a safe seat who will travel around Wisconsin and reignite and reimagine the Democratic Party. Um, as a rural immigrant, I have that organizing experience to connect demographics that have never been represented before uh, and to flip the legislature blue. In Thank November. you so much. Sorry to cut you off, but You're I appreciate fine. your answer. <laughs> um, Ms. Mo, I see your hand next. Would you like to take a minute to address this topic? Yes. Um, Nada is 100% right. Um, we need a Democratic Party that speaks to the progressive values that Wisconsin voters want. We can't, we cannot compromise on our beliefs before we get to the negotiation tables with the Republicans because they will roll us. We need to stand strong. We don't need to become um, meek or um, not speak as boldly as we want to when we're making these negotiations at the state legislature. On top of that, as a state senator, I as an elected state senator, I will make sure that I push progressive politics, not just here in our district, but in every seat across the state, because that's how we're going to win back the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Davis, I think I, see, I saw your hand next, then we'll go to Ms. Latimer Burris. Go ahead, Mr. Davis. This is not just a progressive issue. This is a democratic issue. Uh, our social liberals and our regular liberals, whatever you want to name call, let me explain that we have to fight as Democrats to pass and propose legislation for our citizens. If we are going to be a united Democratic Party, we must unite and focus on the citizens and make sure that they're prioritized and not favor corporations and billionaires. We need to propose legislation that will give stuff to children and families and make sure that they have everything that they need. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Latimer Burris, I believe I saw your hand before. Do you wanna jump in? Oh, sorry, you're muted. <laughs> uh, Ms. Burris, just make sure you unmute first. Yep, thank you. Hold on, just 30 seconds, sorry. I went. Hold no problem. On. Okay, Go now ahead. I think I'm good. Okay, so Nada and I went about this this morning at the Black Women's Wellness. Like, look, um, you know, our country wants a revolution and they also want restoration. That's why we got Joe Biden and then COVID-19, unfortunately, gave us a revolution. Um, if we go in, um, I worked for the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, my boss is Ben Wickler. I can't think of anybody that's more progressive than him. Um, but there's something about if you go in there and you fight, 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 and then you're going to ask to negotiate, it's just going to cause a separation. I think that's what we got with Trump. Is it's a fight, it's a fight, it's a fight. What I think that we need to do is we need to stand united in our differences on moral ground about the right thing to do. And we need to go around and, and, and reach out and bring people in. At least that's what I found in Waukesha as a, as a community organizer there is, you know, people are gonna have a difference of opinion, but 80% of the time people are in, in agreement. And I think when you get into this fight, 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 then you get people separated into camps and you get political decisions like voting that become all about politics. Thank you so much. Um, did anyone else want to address that topic? Seeing no hands, we're going to go back to you, Ms. El Nakashvi, if you want to take 30 seconds to wrap us up.
Can you hear me? Now we can, yep. Okay, sorry. Um, I think that I have had the experiences where I always make sure I point out that I am, you know, not fighting with my party. I am bettering my party, a party that has not represented people that look like me. I've taken flack at times for speaking truth to power, uh, for defending myself as a black candidate against, you know, uh, Senator Carpenter. But the conversations that we had with Ben Wickler and Senator Bewley has really shown us that there are incredible you know, things that we can do to better ourselves and steps to move forward. So from a negative experience and harassment that I've received, we've bettered ourselves. So that's my response. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will move on now to a short lightning round of questions to give listeners a sense of what each of you are like just beyond just policy. Um, so don't think too long on these questions and be quick in your responses. Uh, I will give the same question to all of you and we're going to start with Ms. Mo. Um, what are some of the creative ways you've had to employ to get the word out about your candidacy and reach out to voters as someone who's running for office during the COVID-19 crisis? Um, lots of hand sanitizer and masks for certain. Um, I have, you know, like um, what's called high traffic canvas, which is like when you go out and you're like with people in public settings, but there are no public settings anymore. So we went to bike paths to get nomination signatures and let people know about the policies I stand for. And that's, that's about it. Yeah. That sounds like a, a good way to do it. Um, Ms. Royce, what about you? Well, this has certainly been very different. When I first ran for assembly, I knocked on 20,252 doors and I really miss that. But um, I've just been doing a lot of uh, informal gatherings with people on Zoom. We've done Facebook Live town halls that are interactive. Um, and, uh, you know, my kids are often in, in, earlier actually tonight, my kid came downstairs and tonight she was dressed, but you know, you just kind of have to go with the flow and uh, hope that people forgive that it's you're not in a professional setting right now. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, Mr. Davis, what about you? How have you been reaching out to, to voters during this time? Social media is the, is the main way uh, to do it right now. Uh, Facebook, uh, always studying and posting current events that are going on and, and let the citizens know that things are, you know, are a problem for the citizens that need to be addressed. Uh, and we need to have, you know, politicians get more involved and reform a lot of legislation so that we can get laws passed to help Wisconsin. I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of activity on social media. Uh, Mr. Imes, what about you? Yeah, you know, uh, it's it's a challenge. You know, I've done the uh, the Westside Farmers Market uh, eight weeks in a row, and uh, set up a table there, set up the signs. That's probably the smartest thing I did because uh, there's probably a thousand, fifteen hundred people every Saturday that go through there. I'm on a first name basis with a bunch of folks. I really haven't seen any other candidates. Bill Amani did join me uh, on at least one of the days. So the farmers markets uh, were actually a pretty good play. And then the secret for everyone watching will be, if it's raining on a Saturday and you're still collecting signatures, go to Trader Joe's. They're lined, up, they're lined up in the parking area. There's people from the east side, the south side, the west side, the north side. The, and I, we got tons of signatures hanging out at Trader Joe's. So that's out there now for the world. You've got some pro tips in there. Thanks, thanks for those. Um, Ms. Latimer Burris, what about you? I think you have a, a bus, right? <laughs> yeah, I have, a, well, it's like an RV that's pre, uh, painted red, white, and blue. And um, Brian is gonna come out with me. That's what he said. Um, and I did, um, I did see John out and it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's socially distanced. Um, we can talk to people uh, and do, you know, hustling on the corner out there. Uh, you know, your mama, I wear a mama shirt because I'm a mama. And uh, so we're out on the corner just waving and trying to wear, uh, uh, raise awareness. And it's been a lot of fun. I know that people have missed other people. And I know that it's been very hard on all, all of us candidates to get our names out there and raise awareness. So when you see the red, white, and blue bus, Amani's inside. <laughs> it's really fun. Great branding. Uh, Ms. Elmakashvi, what about you? 
Yeah, I think the the funnest thing I've done so far was uh, a friend, Eileen, Eileen Zeiger, who was the previous president of NARAL uh, Pro-Choice Wisconsin, held a Zoom dance party with her friends and her kids and her toddlers. And so it was really funny to just get up and dance and talk about, about me and, and the campaign. And it was just, I cannot dance at all. So it was uh, an exercise in trying to figure out how to look cool at the same time. <laughs> That's a new one for me. I haven't heard of that before. Right. <laughs> uh, Mr. Benford, you're finishing us off. Well, how have you been reaching out to voters? That's a great question. And I, I just want to say really quick that, Amani, your bus is bigger than my flat. So I definitely <laughs> want to cruise. I definitely want to cruise around with you. Uh, to answer your question, uh, people power. We jumped in this race really, really late. And I was just overwhelmed with the amazing neighbors and friends and people in the community that have known my work. And they jumped out in 11 days and they got more than enough signatures. So that's this whole campaign is about people. And uh, it's been really fun to connect, even though I miss hugs and, and I'm not going to lie, I don't miss pounding doors till I get arthritis or anything, but I do miss that interpersonal connections with people. These are all some, some great solutions you've come up with. Um, Ms. Roy, we're starting with you for the next one. Is there a particular local bar or restaurant you have most missed going to in person over the last few weeks or months? Oh man, um, a lot of them. Although, you know, frankly, the places that I have been going lately are kid friendly. Um, but, you know, we love going to Gates and Broby. That's really fun and we can just walk down there. Um, thankfully, a lot of places are offering delivery. Like we just had Mediterranean Cafe last night and it was just what I needed. So um, I'm doing my part to keep the local economy going and uh, feed my family. And with outdoors, who knows what I'll look like from the waist down after this is all over. <laughs> Mr. Davis, what about you? Any um, favorite bars or restaurants that you're, you've missed going to over the last few weeks or months? Um, no, no, I don't do bars. Um, I'm a former alcoholic, so that's not a good idea for me. Um, <laughs> I used to drink when I was back, you know, younger. And so, you know, no. Um, as far as what do I like to do in my spare time, I like to read a lot. I like to listen to documentaries and listen to uh, audio tapes. That's one of my favorite things to do is to listen to audio and listen to people. Uh, you know, anything that ranges from history to it could be uh, sci-fi stuff. You know, I like sci-fi too. I'm a nerd. I do have that side too. So, I've been listening to an, a lot of audiobooks recently, so I yeah, definitely understand that. <laughs> Mr. Imes, what about you? Any bars or restaurants that you've missed going to? I would agree with Kel. I miss uh, Gates and Barovia. That's only a couple of doors away from Arbor House, so we used to go there quite a bit. I will put a shout out though for Monty's Blue Plate Diner. Uh, on Atwood, uh, we, my son and I, dropped I don't know 400 pieces of lit last Saturday and they were open till 8 30 so we got there about eight o'clock had a nice dinner sat outside it was uh it was a it was a pretty cool experience and we hadn't been there in a while so that was very cool that sounds great uh Ms. Latimer Burris what about you well you know I'm a pizza girl so Ian's pizza and um, my kids like like hate pizza because I always used to have every Friday night let's do a pizza night so they've had had it um yeah so uh you know, I will run down there and get get a slice of pizza. Um, I love the macaroni and cheese pizza. Can you tell that I'm Wisconsin? I'm a Wisconsin girl, so yeah. And uh, so I hope that we all can support small businesses because they're you know they need it and they're really struggling. And I talked to some of the restaurant owners, uh, and we just we just have to work together. So. I and pizza is always a solid choice, so I'm glad you, you put a plug in for Ian's. Uh, Miss Ellen yeah, Gashby, what about you? I really miss Merch Masala, Brianna, mm -hmm. so much. <laughs> Such a great, great State Street restaurant. They have like the best patio also to chill out, so I'm counting down the days. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Benford, what about you? Any bars or restaurants you particularly miss? Oh, you guys are killing me here, being the <laughs> oldest being the oldest person in this race. I mean, I'm, I'm relegated to going to Jennifer Street Market for my social outlets <laughs> these days. But I'm, I'm fortunate I have four adult kids who are just amazing cooks. So uh, when I need that fix, uh, they make the most amazing food. But no, uh, you're talking a whole different reality. 
<laughs> I'm glad to hear you're still eating though. Um, Ms. Mo, what about you? Any particular restaurants you miss? Yes, uh, it's called Umber. It's over by the Willie Street um, on the west side. Mm -hmm. um, the owner is actually my neighbor and it's like the best Indian food in my opinion, my biased opinion. It's the best Indian food in the Madison area. Okay, now that we're all hungry, um, let's move back into the, the individual questions. Uh, before we kind of get into those, let me give you a, a, a sort of a rundown of where we're all at in terms of how many responses each candidate has. Um, so recall that you started with four at the beginning of this debate. Um, Mr. Benford, you have three left. You've, you've used one. Mr. Davis, you also have three left. Ms. Elmakashvi, you have three left. Mr. Imes, you have all four left, so feel free to use them. Um, Ms. Latimer Burris, you have one left. Um, Ms. Mo, you have three left, and Ms. Royce, you also have three left. So I think we'll, have, we'll get a lot of responses in this next section. But um, like I said before, we're going back to individual questions now. And again, some of these are inspired by comments and feedback we've gotten to our pupils' agenda. So you'll see a, a variety of issues rep represented here once again. Um, Mr. Davis, you'll start us off this time. Reminder that you have two minutes to answer, and then any candidate can jump in with a one-minute response. Um, Mr. Davis, in the past, you've said that homelessness, and you brought this up again in your, your initial comments, is one of the key issues facing individuals in the 26th Senate District. The state this session made progress on bills to provide grants to homeless shelters, free up funding for case managers who help families in shelters, work to expand employment and training opportunities, and more, um, though most of those bills have yet to pass the state Senate. Do you think those efforts go far enough to help those who are homeless? And if not, what else should the state be doing? If it was effective, there wouldn't be any homeless people outside right now that are homeless. So it's obvious that it's not effective and that we need to have a uh, more aggressive toned uh, legislation that is brought to the attention of the Republican Party and the Republican constituents that they, they need to help uh, allow Democrats to, to pass and propose these legislative laws so that homelessness can be addressed and that it can be fixed and that we can have our, our citizens put in, in safe homes, period. Uh, there's also a crisis with uh, disabled people that are not able to be acknowledged as being disabled, that are not able to get benefits such as social security, and they are struggling and they need housing, they need food, they need, uh, they need medical. I mean, it's, it's just obvious that this stuff needs to be tackled. It, it, it's, it's horrible right now. It's very horrible and homelessness affects every ethnic group. It's not just blacks. There are poor whites, poor Arabs, uh, poor Latinos. I've seen poor Asians. Um, I've knocked on doors when I was collecting my signatures. I didn't do it through online. I did it personally, knocked on doors being disabled. But I did it because I wanted people to see me and to see uh, that I care about people that are poor and don't have housing and those that do have housing are low income and are uh, low wage citizens. So homelessness is a very, uh, a very must be addressed issue for a politician to get elected. Uh, once elected, that's what William Henry Davis would do if I am elected. Let's tackle this. Uh, one of the things that I used to do when I was younger was give peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to the homeless. Now, whenever I get a chance, because I'm not a rich politician, I'm a poor politician, but when I do have extra change for myself to spare, I make sure that I get uh, sandwiches, get lunch meat, bread, cheese, and chips and juice for the citizens and just pass it out to the citizens that are homeless. If, if we're driving by them, just give it to them. Hey, we need this. And, you know, so we need to tackle this. Um, it's, it's a Wisconsin issue and it's a United States issue, but it's a all ethnic group issue that needs to be addressed and we need to pass legislation. That's what I'm going to do if I'm elected. 
Thank you so much. It appears Chris has frozen, but <laughs> oh, it looks like he's unfrozen now, so he should be able to keep time for us going forward. Uh, Ms. Royce, did you want to address this issue? Yes, uh, seven years ago, I started a small business with the aim of making it more easy and affordable for people to buy and sell homes. And so I really see up close and personal how difficult it is for people in this housing market. And um, one of the missions of our company is to uh, prevent and reduce homelessness. We donate it for, uh, proceed, uh, proceeds to organizations that work to reduce homelessness, but we're on the cusp of a huge crisis. We absolutely need to reinstate a moratorium on evictions um, and on utility disconnections for the duration of this pandemic. Um, we need to do everything we can to prevent homelessness. It is so much easier and more affordable to keep people in safe and secure housing than it is to try to rehome them after they have experienced homelessness. So this is an incredibly important and urgent issue that our legislature has to deal with um, right away. And we also need to make sure that people have safe housing options when, uh, for instance, they're experiencing intimate partner violence. Thank you so much. I'm seeing a lot of hands on this one. I'm going to start from the left of my screen to the right so I don't miss anyone. Um, Mr. Benford, that means you get to start. Um, feel free to take 30 seconds or uh, in a minute. Sorry about okay, that. Okay, great. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, absolutely. We have to address this issue. And, you know, oftentimes uh, some legislation and uh, policymakers put things out there that uh, might be perceived as bandages on problems. Although to the people fighting very hard and the advocates, uh, there's a lot of work and emotion and sweat and tears that goes into that. I'm just wondering that when as a society, when we recognize that we're facing the perfect storm with COVID-19 and with uh, uh, people forced out of their housing, as I said in my opening statement, in the city that we love that wins all these accolades, are we really ready for tent cities? So we need the political will to really shape this issue and uh, fight for it. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Mo, I saw your hand next. Feel free to go ahead. Thank you. This is a very important issue in regards to people facing um, housing insecurity we should be taking a housing first approach because once housing is in place, everything else that a family or individual could be facing gets managed afterwards when housing is in place first. That's why I support um, affordable housing, but as well as um, guaranteed sustainable housing. Um, additionally, um, during the Pride Month, my campaign came out with the LGBTQ plus liberation plan in which we addressed how um, 60 percent of homeless youth identify as a member of the LGBTQ plus community. They have a unique um, issue regarding homelessness that I think our state should be doing a better job of addressing both the social issue as well as the housing insecurity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Royce, I think I saw you next. Feel free to go ahead. Nope, okay, we're gonna go to Ms. El Nakashvi instead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think we have a rent crisis and more rental protections is key to preventing homelessness. Uh, Wisconsin, again, is the most segregated state in the country and not only are we dealing with a legacy of redlining, uh, but we're still experiencing it today. In 2015, Associated Bank reached a $200 million settlement for discriminatory lending practices in Wisconsin. Um, and that's the biggest redlining settlement in our nation's history that happened in our own backyard and it is completely unacceptable. So all of these policies are just a start. Really, the working class needs a seat at the table so that we can fight for housing for all and housing first policies that prioritize housing security. Uh, you know, what we don't need is more decisions being made by representatives who are all homeowners, landlords, uh, or people with vested interest in the real estate business. And you know, Robin Voss is a landlord. Uh, we need la leadership that rents, that truly understands the struggle of, of working class Madison. Uh, you know, I've said it once and I'll, I'll say it again, uh, a really radical idea is that we should start putting forward candidates with the lived experiences of the policies we are addressing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, seeing no other hands, we're going to go back to you, Mr. Davis. You have 30 seconds to wrap up this topic for us. There is no 
question about it. I am the candidate that can address this because I have lived among the poor and the citizens that face hardships and, and those that are low wage earners. Uh, there's no other candidate that will be able to connect with the citizens other than William Henry Davis III. I'm going to fight for our citizens. I'm going to propose legislation that will give those that are felons, that are on the streets, those that don't have any leeway, any guidance. I'm going to fight for those citizens, and that's what I'm going to do as a politician. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Sorry to cut you off there, but we're at time. Um, Ms. Emily Koshby, we're going to you next for the next question about health care. You're among the many candidates in this race who have talked about the importance of expanding health care. One way Governor Tony Evers has sought to do that is by trying to push the state to accept federal Medicaid, Medicaid expansion dollars, a proposal that was rejected by legislative Republicans during the budget debate last cycle. It's unlikely Republicans, or it, it is likely Republicans will retain control of the legislature this cycle, but unlikely that they'll drop their, their opposition to this plan. Given that reality, is expanding Medicaid still worth fighting for? And if so, how would you seek to work across the aisle to do that? Absolutely. I think there's no question that our healthcare system is broken and that we must support and champion uh, Medicare for all on the federal level while expanding Medicaid in Wisconsin uh, through Badger Care in the meantime. I mean, it's not a fight that we, we should give up. More importantly, we need to address the underlying conditions of our healthcare system and why it's built to serve anyone but the working class. COVID-19 has, has further highlighted that the healthcare industry is only interested in expanding their profit margins. I've seen this myself. My mother struggled with you know, some chronic health conditions and I became the primary caregiver for my family a couple years ago. I've seen the way that the system fails individual people and puts the barrier after barrier for the working class. Uh, now more than ever, the progressive movement must come together to fight for universal health care. Uh, Governor Evers is doing everything he can, but Robin Voss and the GOP uh, would rather hold on to power than help Wisconsinites. I think Governor Evers needs a progressive ally, someone from a safe democratic stronghold like Madison, who can take a difficult position and shift the political conversation to the left uh, without compromise. So here's my radical position. In the richest country in the world, no one should suffer or die because they're poor. Uh, we must immediately expand Badger Care to all of the Wisconsinites that have lost their employer health care due to layoffs, all of those who currently lack insurance and enroll all undocumented Wisconsinites as well. Uh, we must expand universal testing and contact tracing and ensure that anyone who seeks testing or treatment for COVID-19 does not have to pay a penny. Uh, and you know, it's also important to note that racial disparities of COVID-19 in Wisconsin are stark with African Americans, you know, amounting to 6% of the population, but 29 percent of all deaths. Uh, we need to prioritize health care and funding to hospitals in rural and marginalized communities, and we can't let go of that fight. Thank you so much. Does anyone else want to address this topic of expanding health care access? Um, I see Mr. Ames's hand. Let's start with you. Feel free to take a minute. I'll jump in. I thought Nada did a great job kind of summarizing the topic. I mean, when we're talking about protecting workers, I mean, worker health right now is public health. So whatever the argument was for not taking the Medicaid money went out the window with COVID-19. We've got upwards of 400,000 unemployed in the state. Those folks are losing their health care coverage. Uh, we have to take the money to take care of folks. So that's one. Two, I would argue if there's any money left over, we also use it for paid, paid sick leave, paid family leave, paid medical leave. I mean, so that, you know, we've got... We've got line essential workers that can't make rent, can't put food on the table, and feel like they have to go to work even though they may not be feeling that well. We need these folks to stay home and take care of themselves. We need folks to stay home and take care of their loved ones uh, who, may be, who may be ill or not feeling well. So the world changed. And for, for someone to make the argument that we just can't take the money, that we're, we're still one of, I think, 13 states that will not take the Medicaid money as allowed by the Affordable Care Act, that has to change. Thank you. Um, I saw a couple more hands. Who wants to go next? Um, Ms. Mo, let's start with you. In regards to expanding Medicaid at the state level, um, whoever, <laughs> as state senator, I expect that the conversations with Republicans that reach across the aisle to get this important uh, policy done 
will require a conversation. And you have to keep engaging in that conversation again and again. You cannot give up. You cannot secede any amount of it because it is so important and it is life and death for Wisconsinites. So as State Senator, I will be introducing the, um, ex expanding Medicaid and ultimately with the goal of having Medicare for all at the federal level, but recognizing that until then we need to have a healthcare system that covers every Wisconsinite. We need to be accepting it and every second we aren't, we need to be pushing that conversation every single second. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak to this issue? Um, seeing no hands, <laughs> I will, I will return to Mr. Uh, or Ms. Elmakashvi, sorry, that question was for you. Would you like to take 30 seconds to wrap up this topic for us? Yeah, I think what I would like to end with is that these policy proposals are great, but if we do not flip the legislature, we will not be able to get our progressive ideals through uh, and, and save the lives of Wisconsinites. And so I think it's time to reimagine what our moves are as, as Democrats. What we've tried in the past isn't working. Um, and that's why I think I have the unique experience of door knocking and organizing across the state of Wisconsin to be able to unite communities, rural immigrants, um, rural communities of, of color as well who have not been represented who have not been introduced and included in the democratic process in districts that are made up of 40 thank votes. you so much sorry to cut you off um, we're, we're going to Ms. Mo next and we're going to talk about the next two questions will be about policing and um, corrections changes uh, Governor Tony Evers and Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes last month proposed bills that would ban the use of chokeholds by police only allow deadly force as a last resort barred no knock searches and more um, you've talked about the importance of you you know, making changes to policing in Wisconsin. Do you think these proposals meet the moments and go far enough? And other other you know plans the state should be looking at. Can you hear me? It's okay. Now we can hear you. Yep. Okay. So I'm so sorry. Um, Thank you so much for asking this question. I am very excited that we are making the making this a conversation. It has been going on for people for too long in this country when a policing system that, by the way, is not broken. It's working exactly as it was designed to. It was created at a time when what we wanted, what we wanted, what the hegemonic community wanted was to put down the voices of black people and brown people. We need to be having a conversation about policing and criminal justice. The legislation that has been introduced is a good start. I think it needs to go farther and we need to push for more. Um, I support community control over policing. Um, I believe that we should be giving funds that would be given out to policing um, to the police, instead be using that to help other community organizations which can better respond to the crises that our community is facing. Um, whether that be increasing funding for educators or social workers or mental health services, we need a different approach to how we manage crises so that we are not losing more lives. Um, in, in addition, when it comes to the criminal justice system, I am uh, against for-profit prisons. I think we need to shut down every single one. Um, I think we need to get rid of the cash bail system. We need to be reducing our prison populations, um, as well as creating expungements for nonviolent drug crimes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does anyone else want to address the issue of policing in the bills that the governor has introduced? Um, seeing, oh, Mr. Imes, I just caught your hand. Feel free to take a minute. I appreciate that, Brianna. You know, uh, I support what the governor and lieutenant governor uh, proposed. There's a lot of good things there. I also support uh, justice in policing. You know, I think the, the governor's bill could add some, some elements. Uh, prohibiting uh, racial profiling, I think that's something that should be a part of any bill that moves forward. And the other thing I'd like to see is a uh, requirement for officers to wear body cameras and operate them properly. You know, we've had body cameras in the village uh, the last two years. It was a no-brainer for me. It was an easy call. It helps protect the public. It helps protect the officers. And uh, ultimately, I think it creates more uh, transparency, accountability, and justice for all. So I'd like to see that as part of the bill moving forward. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Royce, I see your hand. Feel free to take a minute. 
ultimately what I think we all want is public safety. And right now, uh, and for generations, we've been putting way too many eggs in the basket of policing and prisons. It's not working. It's bankrupting our state both morally and financially. Um, and Wisconsin is the worst in the nation in terms of racial disparities in our criminal justice system. We incarcerate three times as many people as Minnesota and we're not any safer. And with COVID, this is even more urgent. We have to reduce the prison population. We have to end mass incarceration and take drastic steps to make uh, the law enforcement that we do have more fair and just. We can invest in real public safety when we invest in housing and communities in public school and childcare and things that people really need to thrive because communities that have their needs met are safe communities. And that's ultimately what we want. Um, the governor's put forward something that's a great start, but I think we also need to look um, at what they're doing federally with the BREATHE Act that really is talking about how can we make sure that every neighborhood is a safe neighborhood. Thank you so much. Um, let me see if I see, I don't see any other hands. So that means we'll go back to you, Ms. Mo. Do you wanna take 30 seconds to wrap us up on this topic? Not yes. A Oh, oh, sorry about my that. My hand is up. My hand was up too. Oh, sorry. My screen must have froze. Uh, we'll go to you, Mr. Davis, first, and then we'll go back to Ms. El Makashvi. We need to protect our police men and women in uniform, and we need to also protect our citizens from bad police officers. We need to conduct uh, legisl We need to conduct more studies that can actually. Uh, benefit our citizens, but we need to study more and pr propose more legislation that will tackle uh, police brutality, police abuse. And one of the things I want to make clear is this is not a race agenda. It's not a, a race hate thing. This is a unity thing. We have to fight for all police officers and all citizens. And that's what I'm going to do as state senator. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. El Makashvi, let's go to you. Sorry for missing both of your hands before. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, I think while we need to talk, take a look at police brutality and criminal justice, uh, we need to take also a moment to think about the whole system. Very simply, there are two Madisons. In one, the average household income is over 85,000 and families thrive with quality education and numerous opportunities in this vibrant city. Uh, and in the other Madison, the one that folks in power don't really talk about, the average household makes $27,000 a year. Uh, they struggle to access quality education. They find themselves in danger by many of the institutions that are so blindly trusted by the first Madison, the Madison that is in power. Uh, we must come to terms with the fact that Wisconsin is still grappling with the legacy of slavery. Systemic racism is embedded in the DNA of our schools, healthcare systems, economy, housing, um, and indeed our criminal justice system. And so Wisconsin has not fulfilled the promise of forward to the black community. Uh, and we need to have that as a basis of our legislating. Thank you so much. Um, now that you're all unfrozen, I can definitely vouch for the fact that no other hands are up. So let's go back to you, Ms. Mo. Do you want to take 30 seconds to wrap us up on this topic? Absolutely. Thank you so much for, in, for asking this question, because this is a very important conversation to how we as a state are going to be moving forward, how we as a nation are going to be moving forward. Um, I agree with most of what's been said today, but I do want to more point out that, just reiterate, that we need community control over policing at this time. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Imes, we're going to continue this conversation, but just expand it to the criminal justice system more broadly, as other candidates kind of touched on. You and other candidates just participated in a forum, actually, on this very topic um, yesterday, I believe. Um, what are changes beyond policing the state should be considering? You talked a lot about body cams and things like that, but what about measures to, for example, reduce the prison population by releasing nonviolent offenders and things like that? Yeah, you, you are muted, Mr. Imes. Thanks, Brianna. Sorry about that. So um, we, obviously, we over-incarcerate folks. It's, it's disproportionate uh, compared to states around us. I think uh, we're three times what uh, Minnesota does, for example. We're spending more on corrections 
than we spend uh, in the University of Wisconsin. So what we heard yesterday at the Moses Forum was a very powerful hour of presentations and opportunities uh, to addressing mass incarceration, the amount of individuals that are actually under supervision and under parole greatly exceeds other states uh, around us. We need to fundamentally address all this. And I think, um, you know, primarily from a couple of imperatives, one is uh, COVID-19. We, we have a pandemic and we're housing way too many prisoners uh, for in too small spaces. We're exposing them. We're exposing uh, uh, our, our, our laborers and, uh, and corrections folks. So that's one. Two is from a budget imperative. We just can't afford to incarcerate as many people as we have currently. There's a lot of folks that are well beyond uh, their parole periods, but because of truth and sentencing and some other things that have passed previously that need to be addressed in the legislature, um, you know, I think once those are addressed, then we're gonna be able to parole more folks, we're gonna be able to pardon more folks, and we're gonna be able to reduce the costs associated with, with, uh, with uh, 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 dealing with uh, prisoners and, and, and folks that are convicted. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Benford, I saw your hand. Do you wanna take a minute to address this? Yes, thank you so much. So I said it before that uh, when we talk about systemic racism, it's weaved through all of these issues, whether it's climate change, whether it's policing, whether it's the rate of incarceration, housing. But when I think about in our unjust incarceration system, our pipeline to prison, what really is showcased is, uh, once again, systemic racism, as I think as a society that it costs more to incarcerate someone than to send them to the UW-Madison. So if we really want to make systemic changes, I really believe in my heart that we need policymakers with real lived and formed experiences that can go and advocate with groups like Moses and Expo. So thank you so much for this question. Thank you for addressing this issue. Um, seeing no other hands. Oh, Ms. Letimer Burris, go ahead. Okay, well, oops. Oh, oh no, oh no, oh no. Just a second, one second. Okay, um, so we, okay, so we did Moses yesterday and I guess I got a little bit emotional about it because my brother has been in and out of the system for 40 years, so I'm well aware of that. My husband is a public defender. Um, I have spent 15,000 hours in the Wisconsin uh, um, statute. So we got to get off talking points on all of this and get down to reality. Um, when I added up the cost of my brother being incarcerated over 40 years, they spent $1.5 million on one person. We can do something different. We got to bring all the stakeholders to the table. And uh, I didn't even like the word stakeholders, so let me rephrase that. We need to bring people to the table to talk about this, to have impact, to be impacted, and come up with real solutions. Because it costs communities money. Uh, whether you are in that community or not, eventually it's reaching your home. Because people be incarcerated, they come out. And, there is, uh, and then they go back in. And this, so they cost you money, cost you time, um, cost you energy. So I think that we can dig into that and we can get beyond simple talking points. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you for addressing that. And that was your last response. So it looks yeah. like you're you're out for the rest of the, the debate. Um, let's see, I don't see any other hands. Sorry, I'm not missing anyone. Okay, great. We'll go back to Mr. Imes if he wants to take 30 seconds to wrap us up. Well, I'll just say, uh, I, I thought what Amani shared uh, last night with about her brother was, was very touching and very powerful. And, the system is messed up. The amount of people that are getting caught up in administrative things and complexities and crimeless re revocations, all that has to go away. Uh, this, is not, this is not about uh, hurting public safety. This is not about releasing criminals to the street. These are people that are caught up in the system who have who've paid their, t their, their time, uh, they paid their debt to society, and we need to find ways to 
to bring them back in to get them in transitional job Thank you so much. Sorry to cut you off, but we're going to head now back to Ms. Latimer Burris, actually. Um, I wanted to ask you about the fact that you're running to represent, and, and all of the candidates here are running to represent a very blue district in a very progressive part of the state. How do you think lawmakers representing this district should balance pursuing a liberal agenda with compromising with Republicans to get things done? And how would you strike that balance as a first time office holder? Okay, good. I'm unmuted. Um, you know, I did that in Waukesha. I was the community organizer down there in Waukesha and in Milwaukee County. So I had to balance both. And, and again, what I found is that when you just get into real conversations, you really start listening to people, you really start asking questions, you start having follow up questions, you get off of talking points, you get off of what the policy says that, you know, we all have downloaded and read. And you start asking questions. Like when I was a journalist, I started out asking a lot of questions. You get in and you find uh, common ground. And so I think that um, we can let the GOP handle uh, the extreme that they've gone to. I think that uh, we as a country are going to change that in November. And then we're going to need to get back to healing. So I think it's reaching out, finding common ground, um, and uh, uh, you know, having conversation, it's done in conversation, having empathy, seeing me and you and you and me united in our differences. And that's really why I came up with the united in our differences, because I thought about it. I thought, you know what, everybody wants the same thing, food, housing, health care, education. They want to make it through COVID-19. They want their parents to age uh, respectfully. Uh, they want to do all these different things. They don't want their brother sitting in prison for 40 years, um, you know, for something that is, you know, that he could have murdered someone and got out earl earlier. Um, we don't want to do that. And it's not good for any society. And whatever affects one society is going to end up affecting all of us. So I think it's crucial that we come to this point. We went through Trump. Uh, it's time for Trump to go. Uh, it exposed all the problems that we have. And we need everybody at the table in diversity to make a difference. Thank you so much. Mr. Imes, I see your hand. Feel free to go. Yeah, you know, I lived in uh, Waukesha County for seven years. I ran the environmental affairs for Quad Graphics. That was a long time ago, but it was a company that added more jobs in the 80s and 90s than any other company. I just think I'm going to be, or I have the potential to be the strongest voice representing the district. Uh, working with a company like that, starting a business, a small business of my own, making a payroll every week, serving as elected official. Uh, through the nonprofit, we have found ways to bridge, you know, builders and environmentalists on clean energy issues, on green building issues, on ecotourism issues. So I think just because of my background and diversity of experiences, that's gonna allow me to be a much more effective, much more engaging legislator and, and, and bring folks to the other side and make the economic case for these issues like the Green New Deal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Royce, I think you might want to speak. Yeah, because this is really, really important. I have spent my life as an activist and somebody who cares about the state turning progressive ideas into real change. When I was in law school and worked on the Innocence Project, I worked with some of the most conservative legislature, legislators in the state to pass landmark mark criminal justice reforms, um, addressing police procedure, when I was the executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin, I helped build a coalition that passed the first pro-choice law in a generation through an anti-choice GOP controlled assembly. And in the legislature, I never hesitated to speak out and speak my mind and even uh, hold my own party accountable when it was necessary. And yet I was still again and again able to pass bipartisan legislation. We have wonderful candidates with great ideas and all of us um, bring different qualities but I have a demonstrated record of again and again being able to pass progressive legislation in very difficult circumstances. And that's one reason why um, virtually almost every sitting or former legislator that's endorsed in this race has endorsed me. And that includes Representative Sheila Stubbs, Representative Lisa Subek, Representative uh, Spencer Black, and more. Thank you so much. Um, that was your final, yes, by my tell you, that was your final response. So just, just so you're aware, you have none left to use for the rest of this debate. Um, I do not see any other hands, but again, I might be frozen, so who knows. Um, Ms. Latimer Burris, we're going to go back to you then if you want to take 30 seconds to wrap yeah, up. Yeah, so um, with Kelda getting all the endorsements, she was the first one in. I don't know that we all had a lot of time for other people to get to, get to know us. That's 10 seconds. 
in Waukesha, I worked with the Democrats, Independents, Republicans, pushed up the numbers for Jill Karofsky. Uh, that is in the data. It's evident. Uh, I started out my career as a journalist. I was a small business owner, a Main Street owner, had employees, and uh, worked as a teacher. So again, it's about finding me and you and us working together. Um, and somebody who's ever going to get in this position, they're going to have time to do that, time to reach up go out to Green Bay, go out to Wausau, go out to these different places and show that we really are all on the same page. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna move on to our last two questions, which are both about education. The first one is for Mr. Benford. Um, you've talked about the importance of education not suffering amid the current uncertainty. In terms of higher education, the UW system has had to bear the brunt of the $70 million spending cut the state made in May. Governor Tony Evers last week announced another $250 million decrease to offset revenue losses from the COVID-19 crisis but it's not clear yet how much of a loss the UW system campuses would be expected to absorb in this round. Do you believe the UW system should be included in this second round of cuts? And separately, is there a state action needed to ensure the fall semester occurs safely at these schools? Well, that's a, that's a really big question, Brianna. And let me see if I can unpack it a little bit. And I should disclose that I work for the UW Madison Odyssey Project where I'm the success coach and the Odyssey is a free year-long course in the humanities that uh, is set up for people that uh, face barriers and challenges to higher education. So I'm biased about this subject and uh, I'm an alumni of Odyssey and I believe that in the state of Wisconsin from pre-K to a four-year degree that colleges should be free. So when it comes to the assaults on public education at every level by the majority party, I would fight very hard to restore those cuts to the UW Madison. Now, on to your second question. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I follow CDC uh, recommendations and news, and I'm terrified at the thought of uh, campuses opening, not only at the, at the uh, 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 K through 12 level, but at the higher level, I'm terrified that uh, as we're seeing spikes in this, uh, of disease, this pandemic, that uh, I worry about uh, my friends that are sending their kids as freshmen. And uh, in this uncertain world, when you think about the college experience, uh, there's just so much socialization and it's just right for uh, people to put their lives at risk. So I would hope that uh, the UW, uh, whether it's hybrid or reimagining what education could look like, I should also disclose that at 60 years old, I graduated from the UW last May with my master's degree in social work. So as I think about these young students that are coming in, it really breaks my heart that their lives will be put at danger uh, for sometimes false economic gains. So when it comes to your question, we should restore those cuts and enhance our university system, and we should follow the best science to keep our students safe. Thank you so much. Does anyone else? Oh, Mr. Imes, feel free to take a minute to weigh in. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Brian on the on the whole safety issue. I mean, you know, part of this is going to be in terms of the budget. You know, where are our priorities? And what I've said, I mean, I've got a financial background. I've got a business background. You know, we have to find the money savers. And uh, there's a couple of them. One is we have to dismantle all the uh, all the money, all the infrastructure, all the grants, all the tax credits that go into the, the attracting non-local multinational corporations like Foxconn. They just dismantle all of that. Redirect it to defend the University of Wisconsin and a stronger uh, funding contribution uh, to higher education in the state. I would also direct some of that to um, our small businesses and our main streets that just have gotten devastated by COVID and, and, and other issues. And then we have to look at a more equitable tax system. You know, we've got, uh, 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 filers that are getting over a hundred million dollars in tax credits every year that actually made over three million dollars last year. That's not sustainable. That's not something that we can continue. Thank you so much, Mr. Imes. And for whatever it's worth, that was your last uh, response as well. Um, let's see, I don't see any other hands. So we will go back to you, Mr. Benford, for 30 seconds on this topic. Thank you. You know, I said it before, and it sometimes feels like we're living in an altered reality when we think about cuts to our university system. 
and we think about who are the most highest paid individuals on campus and those being sports coaches and uh, people do athletics, which I, I, I love sports. But when you think about our priority as a society and where we're at, that we have to have these conversations where uh, we know that we live in the most racist state, that we have great disparities throughout our educational system from top down, that we really do need to support our education. Thank you, Mr. Benford. Um, this last question is going to Ms. Royce, and we're going to do something a little unique with this, so um, hope that it goes well with me. Um, this comes from a People's Agenda conversation that we recently had with the Local Voices Network, and the speaker is named Layla, um, and she is an incoming UW-Madison student. Um, whoops. I'll have to reshare that. Anyway, um, so we're going to hear from part of her responses about education in, in her own words um, to set us up for this last question. Like the summer slide and uh, the whole virtual education uh, deal is going to be affecting, of course, students of color and people from low socioeconomic backgrounds the most who are already being affected by the achievement gap, especially. And so that adds on to the illiteracy to prison pipeline or just like the reading crisis here in Madison, because the people who are behind, they it's much harder to catch up anyway. And so adding on this idea of COVID-19 slide onto that is going to put them even further behind. And since the community and the district isn't really paying attention to this problem. No one's really creating programs or opportunities to really help those students get to where they need to be. All right, so that kind of leads into our final question again for Ms. Royce. What additional resources do you think K-12 schools need from the state to ensure gaps between students aren't further exacerbated in this time? And, and should lawmakers be doing more to shape what academics looks like this fall? Absolutely. I mean, it's infuriating, frankly, that schools and parents and kids are being put in this situation because we have had no leadership at the federal level. Other countries have tackled this. Other countries have figured out how to manage COVID, how to get it under control. And yet here we are uh, bailing out cruise ships and airlines and leaving parents and families with nothing. Um, first, we know that many schools are going to be virtual in the fall. That's a necessity because we have not kept the virus under the control. And we know that um, low-income students and students of color uh, are gonna suffer more because of that. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that every kid has a device that works and a broadband internet connection. Um, that has to happen immediately. But we also have to support additional staffing for schools to manage virtual learning because as a parent, I know it's incredibly difficult to be managing virtual learning um, and I have a parenting partner, I'm in the luckiest position, I can work from home. So many people don't have that, and we need to provide that support and additional staffing on the school side to help virtual learning be successful. Secondly, to manage the transition back to in-person schooling, which is necessary for so many reasons, but also because kids need social development. Um, and we know that a lot of kids are just not gonna be well served by virtual learning. We need money for extra space to reconfigure space that is already there, um, to move to outdoor classrooms where that's possible, to increase staff, and to keep um, small groups consistent where there's a teacher and a couple of students together in a pod. Um, right now, we have a school system that has totally been defunded for decades, and teachers are buying their own school supplies. We absolutely cannot put them in this situation, and we need to make sure that they have the money that they need for um, air ventilation, for hand sanitizers for masks for all the things that are necessary. And we have to recommit to public education. That means ending the private voucher program that sucks those dollars out of schools and funding public schools equitably so that these districts with the highest need get what they want. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Elmikashvi, go ahead. Yeah, in answer to that question, I think we, we need to say out loud the truth, which is that Wisconsin's public school funding formula is prejudiced against school districts with higher populations of impoverished families, with English language learners, with special education students, and, and in cities. Uh, we really need to fight to replace the broken poverty tax system with new equitable funding streams for schools. 
we need to fully fund schools uh, and also have uh, uh, you know a dedication uh, alongside it to protecting our teachers to protecting our unions um, education and educational equity is an issue that's so incredibly important to me I'm a product of Madison Public Schools and UW Madison and uh, I'm lucky to be endorsed by Madison Teachers Incorporated as well as American Federation of Teachers Wisconsin and the TAA and so with them uh, in protecting and and uh, emboldening our teachers we can really promote educational opportunity and closing the educational achievement gap in in Wisconsin thank you so much um, mr. Davis feel free to go ahead we need to we need to bring our, our schools back to the public school settings uh, for in the long run that's our main goal uh, and I think that needs to be done so that we can restore traditional school values for our students. And right now, during this short time, uh, COVID period, our, our students are, you know, they're, they're learning a new technology, they're learning new ways to, uh, to, to perceive, you know, academic studies, to perceive uh, unlimited knowledge online. Um, as a state senator, I'm going to propose the K-12 Field Trip Act that will pay for school field trips yearly for all of the students that need schooling and, 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 and fund educational field trip knowledge awareness uh, that would pertain to their studies of their classes that they take. I'm also going to propose uh, the Lunch for All Act for our students that will give free lunches to our students that are Sorry to cut you off, Mr. Thank Davis. Um, that is actually time, but thank you for addressing this issue. Is there anyone, okay, seeing no other hands, oh, uh, Mr. Benford, yep, go ahead. Do I have one more on the table, Brianna? <laughs> this is your last one, you're okay. using it wisely. <laughs> so as a father of four kids who graduated from Madison schools and someone who has a, a second grader at Lowell Elementary School and as someone who's worked in the schools, I think there's an aspect of this conversation that um, we're not touching on. Uh, of course, we need to fund our schools and put a pri priority on them. But in addition to the educational context, schools are the front lines for mental health services oftentimes, helping to deal with homelessness, domestic violence, and trauma. So as we think about funding our schools and we think about the whole big picture of schools, there is that component that's not oftentimes talked about. And right now during COVID-19, I'm seeing firsthand at real time so many kids and families that are suffering. And I can't imagine what happens when the school year starts with utility shutoffs and there's a, up, there's a chance where they won't have broadband or internet. Uh, so once again, I hate to be the messenger of doom and gloom, but we're headed for this perfect storm and uh, education throughout COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Benford. I'm sorry to have to cut you off there, but seeing no other hands, we're gonna go back to you, Ms. Rice, for the final word on this, you have 30 seconds. Thank you. We have to do all these things, not just for K-12 that I talked about, but also for childcare. We simply cannot reopen the economy if we haven't handled this important piece. Um, we need to also address the student loan debt crisis. Um, that's a piece that doesn't get talked enough about in terms of education. And I'm also concerned that we're going to have an exodus from public schools. And so we need to make sure that public schools have a hold harmless so that they don't lose funding if parents decide that they're going to opt out of the virtual schooling or in-person schooling this fall. As a parent, this is really personal to me. Um, there are only seven out of 33 women in the Senate, and not one of them has any young kids. Thank you, Ms. Royce, um, for addressing this issue. We're going to move on now to, and I am very over time, and I'm well aware of that. So we're going to move on to closing remarks. And if it's okay with you, um, you, with you all, in the interest of all of your time and the viewers at home, let's cut these down to one minute, if that is possible for everyone. Um, to, to start then with these um, closing remarks, we're going to go to Ms. Latimer Burris. You're up first. Okay, well, what I was going to do was finish up where I left off, but I definitely don't want to get cut off. So um, I just, look, as your senator, I'm going to advocate for you. We've got a lot of complex issues. I have the background uh, to address these things. I worked on, uh, you know, I, I went through housing insecurity. I lived at, you know, $4.2 million of living at Super 8. 
I got it. And so what we need to do is we need to uh, go through these issues uh, and, and look at them. We need to bring people together. We need to uh, uh, work on being respectful and, uh, you know, uh, listening to different points of view and to work in diversity. And I know that I can do that. Um, and I know that's going to take a lot of time and it's going to be a hard work, but I'm up for it. I made it. <laughs> you did great. That was really impressive. Uh, Mr. Imes, how about you go? First, I want to thank the Cap Times again for putting together a great forum and of course my fellow candidates and you the voters for tuning in during such a difficult time when both the physical health and socioeconomic health of our community are at risk. You know, I'm an elected official, environmental nonprofit leader and small business owner, rooted in the community for over two decades. I bring a uniquely diverse experience that can move beyond you know, business and politics as usual and hopefully put people first. You know, my goal is to make the state a model for high practices and provide incentives to those that adopt them and enact legislation requiring them. You know, providing a livable, fair wage, family-friendly benefits, work-life balance, education, technical training, and a just transition, particularly for women, immigrants, and people of color, it will help reduce social economic disparities and make an economic recovery uh, that works for all. Um, I, I encourage you to visit uh, our website at johnimes.com. Uh, I certainly would appreciate your support and, of course, uh, would appreciate your vote on, on August 11th. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Mr. Davis, you're up next for your one minute of closing remarks. As a state senator, I am going to fight for our citizens that are suffering from poverty, that are low wage, low income. I'm gonna raise the minimum wage and fight to propose legislation that will give tremendous benefits for our citizens. I'm gonna promote diversity. We have candidates that don't promote it. They're actually one-sided with the black movement. And I want to say that it's not just about blacks, it's about all citizens of all ethnic groups. And I'm gonna propose legislation that will fight the common issues for a common society. I am also gonna fight for our animals. A part of our Medicaid program, I'm gonna fight for pet care, which is gonna be my proposed legislation. I'm gonna fight for the second amendment. I'm gonna fight for marijuana to be legalized. And I'm gonna fight for housing and our small family farms. Our education is very important and we have to get a politician that's gonna fight for the values of our students and teachers and that's gonna propose legislation that will give increased wages. And thank you, Mr. Davis, salary. sorry to cut you off. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you. Um, Ms. Royce, we're going to you next for your closing statement. Thanks so much for watching and for hosting this debate. We face very serious challenges in our state and in our country with the pandemic and the economic fallout. I have a long history of turning progressive ideas into real results into state law. And I've done that with a wide variety of professional backgrounds. I'm an attorney. I'm a small business owner. I ran a statewide nonprofit advocacy organization working to expand access to women's health. And I served two terms in the Wisconsin State Assembly. I know what the job is. I know how challenging it is to serve in a minority legislature. And that's why, in addition to being a loud, strong, and proud voice for bold progressive policies, which you can read about on my website, keltheroys.com, I'm going to be doing every single thing I can from the day after this primary ends until election day to make sure that we elect more Democrats statewide. You don't have to wonder about that because I've done that uh, throughout my adult life. Um, I got involved in politics early and I've never stopped. And it's because I care so deeply about building a more just and equitable future for all of us. We need someone who can help us build a legislative majority and lead on the issues that will make Wisconsin. Thank you, Ms. Royce. Sorry to cut you off, but we're gonna head now to Ms. Mo for her closing statements. Thank you so much, Brianna and Chris for hosting this event, helping host this event. Thank you to Cap Times and to Wisconsin Eye. Um, and thank you to everyone watching at home. As state senator, <laughs> I will stand for progressive conversations that are necessary, not just in this district, but in every district across the state. We need guaranteed housing. We need to end the voucher school system. We need to abolish ICE. We need to support a badger care for all system, legalize cannabis and create expungements for nonviolent drug offenses. 
These are the progressive conversations that I'm willing to take to the state legislature and produce results. If you loved what I had to say tonight, donate to my campaign at AishaForStateSenate.com. Find out how you can get a yard sign still in these last two weeks by emailing us at AishaForStateSenate at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter or Facebook at Aisha for Wisconsin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mr. Benford, it's your turn. Feel free to plug your, your yard signs if you'd like. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Capital Times, and for all of you that are with us tonight. With two insidious diseases ravaging our world, COVID-19 and for centuries longer systemic racism, I believe that people with diverse backgrounds now more than ever before need to come together in respect, unity, and love to forge a new, safe, socially just, and equitable Madison and state of Wisconsin. The 26th district is the heart of Madison, and for many years, the most progressive district in the state. People want change. They don't want politics as usual. There is a need for more diverse informed voices, not career politicians at the state capitol. With your support, I will lead the charge to unite us all. In order to win on August 11th, I need your vote. For more information, please visit BentfordForSenate.com. Thank you all and please stay safe. Thank you so much. Ms. Elmikoshby, you're, you're finishing us off for the night. If I can unmute myself. Awesome. Uh, from across the world, I've come to know Madison as my home since I was a little girl. And I've learned that sometimes speaking out and fighting for what's right, what you know in your heart is right, gets tough. But I keep fighting because I'm inspired by my family and by my community uh, who keep fighting no matter what. While our campaign highlights true inequities in Madison, we continue to blend hope with accountability. We celebrate forward movement by remembering the facts of our uncomfortable past and present. We acknowledge that we can change for the better, even though it doesn't always feel positive to talk about, but the healing is positive. Through our volunteers, supporters, and neighbors, we have built a campaign unlike anything that's been seen in Wisconsin. This is an intergenerational, multicultural, multiracial, ideological, diverse coalition of voters, of movement for permanent change. Together, we will win this election, and then on August 12th, the day after the primary, our working class movement will come together again to work to flip the legislature and turn Wisconsin blue. Please join us at notaforwisconsin.com slash volunteer. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you, Cap Times. Thank you all so much for participating in this event and tolerating, you know, all the technical issues we've had to endure. So I really appreciate that. And thank you to all of the viewers who are right along here with us. Once again, the primary is between these seven candidates is on August 11th. We're currently drafting our people's agenda, as I've mentioned multiple times, but there's still time to add your voice to the process. Tell us about the key issues or questions you want candidates and elected officials to, to address. Please visit go.captimes.com go slash PA. To learn more about these candidates and others who are running in the open Dane County legislative seats, please check out my coverage at the Cap Times and go back and watch the other three debates. You can do it all tonight if you want. If you're voting by mail, make sure to get your ballots in by election day so they can be counted. Thank you all for watching this evening and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>